antibodies. By measuring those antibodies in the volunteers' blood, the scientists will be able to work out how many people have actually been exposed to the virus. They will also investigate how long these antibodies stay in the blood and their quality, which will show whether the country would be able to combat a second round of infection. The concept of group or herd immunity is to allow the virus to spread in a controlled way through the least vulnerable groups in society in order to create a level of immunity in the population over time that will ultimately, it's hoped, protect those who are most at risk. You're listening to the World News from the BBC. The human cost of the coronavirus in Spain shows no sign of abating. It has once again registered its highest daily number of fatalities. 864 patients died in 24 hours. More details from Guy Hedgeco in Madrid. The latest increase in the number of infections means that the country has now registered more than 100,000 cases. The government has been saying for several days that the virus is showing signs of stabilising. And despite the grim nature of the latest figures, new infections are growing at a slower rate than they were last week. But health services in the hardest hit areas of the country, which include Madrid and Catalonia, have been struggling. Shortages of medical equipment have been a particular problem. And today a shipment of three million face masks has arrived from China to ease the burden. Russia says it has begun airlifting what it describes as humanitarian aid to the United States to help in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. But the Kremlin says it expects the Americans to be prepared to reciprocate by donating medical equipment and materials. The exact nature and amount of what Russia is sending is not known, but on Monday, President Trump said the US was getting a very, very large plane load of what he called things. The Australian media group News Corp says the coronavirus outbreak means it must suspend printing about 60 regional newspapers. News Corp, owned by the tycoon Rupert Murdoch, said the pandemic had caused a rapid decline in advertising revenues. Amnesty International says it has evidence that civilians have been killed in recent US drone strikes in Somalia. The rights group said an 18-year-old woman and an older man were killed in two separate strikes which injured three other people. The US has described the victims as members of the Islamist group Al-Shabaab, but Amnesty said satellite and video evidence and local testimony disproved this. BBC News. We're different. We're 98.9. 98.9. Win FM. Morning, everyone. Welcome. You are inside the Meridian Medical Corner on WinFM. Brought to you by Meridian Medical Consultants, South Independence Square, Bastyr. In our little corner, we discuss and answer your questions on common health issues and how they may affect you. It's your health. Get involved. Eastern Wind FM 90.9. It's that time again to bring you Meridian Medical Corner. We say a very good morning to Dr. Andrew Holness. Good morning, Doc. Good, good morning to you, Mr. Bacchus. Well, it's good to hear you both. You know, I mean, we can't have any sort of uh, social distancing with Meridian Medical Corner, you know. We can't have that. I, I mean, <laughs> so, social distancing, as they say. Yeah. Not, well, no, not with Meridian Medical Corner, man. We're going to have mm, physical distancing. That's on through. Yeah, we're going to on through. Yeah, we're going to have physical distancing, but we're going to hook up online. So what's happening yes. this morning? Well, as usual, I mean, the topic of the day, since this is a Meridian Medical Corner thing, is, of course, to see what we can elucidate and ferret through the information with respect to coronavirus 2019. Um, it's, it's, it is on our minds all the time now, not helped by, of course, the social situation within which we find ourselves, but not an issue. Um, so I want to get through a few things, Hi highlight more of the key points, you know, see if we can get rid of some of the speculation, stick to the facts as we know it at the moment, knowing that we're still in an you know, an evolu uh, uh, a process that is in evolution. But the, the key points are set at the moment. It is uh, what we have here called COVID-19 is a viral 
respiratory tract Ill- illness. And the last time I was on radio, we had no cases. And since then, we're now up to eight. And let me tell you, I think it is probably more cases that will come out as the testing becomes more and more, um, e- well, easier to get and flowing. You know, it is, the, the system is working better as we, as we get through the days. So the, the, the good news is the majority of us, will be fine. Yes, you know how the world is. We, we, we spend a lot of time and effort and money on bad news. And the good news is there, and we slide past it. The majority of us will be fine. Eighty percent, if you're relatively healthy, um, will have mild, maybe moderate symptoms, and then it will pass as if it were a flu or a cold, and you'll be back on the other side, the majority. The problem is, Um, the vulnerable groups. We can certainly help ourselves um, with respect to seeing, to reducing the spread, the speed at which it spread. We can do something about that. And the basic idea is what we've been talking about forever, hand washing. This is a good time to shift the paradigm in our entire life with respect to hygiene. We don't pay that much attention to hand washing before this whole outbreak business. But now is an opportunity for us to inculcate it in our daily life, the way that we've inculcated brushing our teeth and having coffee. Well, not for everyone. So we can slow the spread if we remember four big things. I'm not big on lots of stuff. The four essential things to do. Wash your hands. Wash your hands with soap. Hand sanitizers and all that big furor is wonderful for hand sanitizers and sanitizing companies. The bottom line is, good soap solves the problem. The virus is not, at the moment, very resistant to just regular good old soap. You don't even have to have anything fancy. Good old carbolic will still work. One, wash wash your hands often, especially if you're in in contact with other people. It doesn't have to be somebody who you suspect or who has been proven positive. Just Consider everybody has a potential risk to you and wash your hands. When you come home, wash your hands. Before you hug your children, make them wash their hands. Um, the other thing is, of course, avoid touching your face. The face is a big deal, so let's be specific. What we're really interested in is not getting our hands or other objects into our eyes, nose, or mouth. The wet areas, which we call the mucous membrane. Not getting, our, not getting those parts involved reduces the risk because that's how the virus gets into us. It can't penetrate skin and, and bottoms of feet and, and, and um, you know, elbows. It can't get in that way. It has to get into the wet areas. And most, most likely, we put it there. So if you avoid touching these areas, then you avoid the risk of your directly moving the virus from surfaces doorknobs, unwash hands into these areas. Third thing, cover your cough, because that's the other way that we can get these viral particles into us. People cough, and they don't cover, and they spew stuff into the air. Talking can do it too, you know, but talking is not as violent as coughing and sneezing. So you shove it out into the atmosphere, and then hold this now, walk through it, and his eyes and nose and mouth, and he's talking all the time, it goes in there. And here I am infected. So if we individually cover our, our cough, cover our sneeze, elbow, you know, the, 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 the flexed elbow, our tissue, which we dispose of, wonderful idea will reduce the spread immediately. Fourth thing is what Bacchus and I were just talking about, maintaining this distance between humans. I don't like the idea of social distancing because it suggests isolation, not just personal, but also, you know, you keep yourself to yourself in an area where we actually need more social interaction, but not physical interaction. We need to have a human-to-human distance of about six feet. It should not be less. We should err on the side of the higher value. So we're going to say three to six feet. We should be thinking six feet. And if, because that's the distance that a projectile from a cough or a sneeze can travel at the furthest 
unless you have some super powerful sneezes and you don't cover it, six feet is about as far as it can travel. And so that distance is pretty good. Now, in the country, we've established a lot of this already, and, and more and more the government is, is, uh, make, is, is making, it, making us, the populace, take it more seriously, because we should and we have to. So we're good there. We can, the other part of this story is that we can recover faster. If we do get it, we can recover faster. There are some basics that we need to do uh, to, to, to help us, even if we are infected, to get over it quicker. And, we, and it is basically the same advice that we give you with any viral illness, viral respiratory tract illness, like the flu or the cold. Treat the fever. The fever is one of the hallmarks of this disease. Without the fever... Doctors are likely to say, yeah, it's possible, but more than likely you don't have it. But the fever is important. And the fever is not an opinion that you get when you put your hand, your, your hand on somebody's forehead. That's an opinion. That's a guess based on your experience and the temperature of your own hand. So nobody's listening to you. I've been making this point for years. Nobody's listening to you when they say, I think I have a fever. What we want to know in this day and age is that you actually have a measurement that you've done that says my temperature is 37.5 or higher. That measurement is important. It's like driving around without a, without a gas gauge. You don't know. Sometimes you go to the gas station too often, and sometimes you run out of gas on the highway. You need to have a measurement, and that's where the temperature comes in, the thermometer comes in. So measuring the temperature, figuring out when we have a fever, and then Treating that fever is one of the best, easiest ways of getting ourselves to feel better from this virus. Because a fever, man, Lord, take it out of us. Joint pain, muscle pain, want sleep, not hungry, your mouth dries out because the fever is so high and persistent. Treat the fever. Good old paracetamol is what we're advocating. But let me tell you, ibuprofen will work good for some people. Feel free. The other thing is treating the cough. The cough is generated because of all the fluid that the virus causes to have happened and the draining that goes on down into the, into the chest. And with coronavirus in particular, it, um, it, it causes, it, it seems to direct itself towards the lung tissue very much. And it also can cause a cough. And so one of the ways to make ourselves feel better is to treat the cough. And there are many cough medicines about. Some work better than others. Some work good for some people and not others. So start with good old feral. See what happens. If you can reduce the cough, you, the individual sufferer, feels better, which also reduces the amount of coughing of the virus that you're putting out into the atmosphere, and that helps everyone. Basic rules still apply. Hydrate well, which means drink lots of fluid. Notice I didn't say water. Almost all fluids are fair game if you're trying to be hydrated, except alcohol. Alcohol is a dehydrating agent, which is why it works so good for viruses in our hand sanitizer. We do not want to drink alcohol if we want to be hydrated. And so we should, every other fluid is on the table. Whatever you like, at this point, all bits are off. When you hydrate, the simple rule is when you Pass your urine, like within the next 20, 30 minutes, it must be pale yellow. If it's pale yellow, you are well hydrated. If it is dark yellow and concentrated, you, are, you have not hydrated well in the last hour. So it is important because these are the things that make you feel better and recover faster. Eat fresh fruits and veggies as fresh as you can get them. You get the multivitamins and the minerals that you require to help you recover from this, replace the resources. So fresh fruits and veggies are basic to managing this thing. I don't know what will happen with all the curfewing and the lack of supermarket, but the idea is fresh fruits and vegetables. That should be part of what we went to the supermarket for yesterday. Um, rest enough. When you're sick, you want to rest anyway. That's a natural reaction, and you should follow that. It doesn't mean that you have to sleep. It doesn't mean that you have to just lay there, sit there, and just don't move around. 
when you drift off, you drift off. You can get some water in a bottle and so on. Resting enough is important. Get a nap during the day. Go to bed earlier. Wake up later. In all of this, we need to reduce our stress, levels of stress. Thank you for the government. They have said nobody's at work today. So that stress of being having to face the public and the traffic and, and the police pulling you over is gone today. Stay home, chill. If you have internet like I don't have, you then you, you can Netflix as much as you like. So it is so, so the reducing stress is important. And of course, when you start to feel better, exercise regularly. Don't mean going to the gym. I mean finding something physical that you need to that you like to do and that you can do regularly. The fitter you are, the easier it is to recover from these things and the less vulnerable you are. But as we segue to the last thing I want to talk about is vulnerability. Though the majority of us will be fine. That is not the case for all of us. And amongst us are the vulnerable, the people who are 70 years and older, who might be generally fit, but their only risk is just being over the age of 70. We have to look out for these people. These over 70s are the ones that we should be emphasizing isolation. Even if they're not sick and they're not exposed, if you are in your house, then your risk of getting the virus is going to be lower. So the people who are over 70, definitely. Anyone who has diabetes, especially uncontrolled, anyone, any age with heart or lung disease, anybody with uncontrolled hypertension, if you're battling other diseases, like an autoimmune problem like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, or you're battling cancer, or you're on chemotherapy, or you have long-term steroid use, these people are vulnerable. These people should, should, should well control their disease, yes. But think of yourself as being vulnerable, and you stay away. You don't need to be self-isolated by law. You just need to exercise some common sense, and that will be useful. Some people are just frail. They may not have any underlying issues at the moment. They may be otherwise well. But the Lord, man, in their 90s, they're frail, which means that their immune system is sometimes not up to the task of fighting off a hefty warrior like coronavirus. And so these people who are frail also need to be aware and take their appropriate precautions. The rest of us come into it because we know in our own circle of family and friends and community and so on, the people who are likely vulnerable. And so we should go out of our way to make sure that they're okay because now I'm saying you can't go out. Somebody has to come to them, but also um, protecting them from us, the people who are going in and out and carrying viruses back and forth. We need to be exquisitely aware of, how, of, of the risk that we pose to the people that we love the most. So we should be looking out for them. So it is important. Eventually, this is going to start, a, hopefully it's all going to start a whole new trend that especially Meridian is going to be into, the idea of learning, adapting, and acting. You can learn the information, you adapt your lifestyle, and then you act on that, on those changes. That's what I got to say. What do you say, Bacchus? I want to thank you very much for, for, for that because uh, you said it in, in language I could understand. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> thank you so much. Now, I've got a few questions for you if you've got a minute. i got a minute. Okay, good. All right. Let's do this then. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you know about how long this virus survives outside of the body? Not very long. It's, it, depending on the surface, it can, it, it can be uh, just hours. But if it's within the right environment, days. Uh, so if you cough and sneeze, spit your stuff on a surface that is cool and dark, it is much more likely to survive two or three days, sometimes up to five days, depending on what you read. But if it is exposed to sunlight, UV radiation, and heat, it disintegrates pretty quickly. Um, if, and this is a surface that is not clean. So, you know, you per, don't perform any hygiene. Yes, it can last. Fabric lasts a little longer than solid surfaces. 
Um, and so the, the, the need to wash your clothes, for example, becomes, you know, pay, pays into that. What do we know about reinfection? Let's say you recover from it. Uh, can you mm-hmm. be reinfected? That's up in the air at the moment. Depending on who you talk to, and it's, like I said, it is, a, it is a process in evolution. We don't know everything. And so we're suffering from that lack of knowledge and then the conspiracies and theories that come in there when you don't have information. But some people are claiming reinfection within weeks. I'm not sure if that is reasonable. I think your immune system for the majority of healthy people will give you maybe months before you are possibly reinfected. So the people who are first infected in China are the people that we need to be looking at now to see what is your rate of reinfection. And it also depends on, we have to be, we have to be sure that it's actually, that they actually were recovered, which means testing, and then they're negative, both in terms of the, the virus, presence of the virus as well as blood changes. Um, and we need to make sure that they, if they become reinfected, that is with the exact same virus. We don't know, and the virus can change. So, so at the moment, it's still up in the air. We are optimistic that it's going to be one of those diseases in which when we get an immunity to it, it's lifetime. That's what we hope. That may not be of it, unfortunate. That may not be the reality. But we'll know more closer to the vaccine studies than we'll be able to get some better ideas. Now, what about treatment after diagnosis? What happens after you're diagnosed? The treatment is, again, one of those up-in-the-air things. People have touted various combinations of herbals versus medications versus antivirals, and, and, and the studies are ongoing on all of these levels. People have jumped the gun and tried medications that are relatively available for other things, and the outcome has been fatal in some areas. So I would not advocate putting too much stock at the moment on any cure. You, there are strategies that are supportive, some of which I mentioned. If you do get to the point of being very ill and you need hospitalization, then that is going to be a, 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 on a case-by-case basis. Do you need oxygen? You get that. Do you need a ventilator? You get that. Do you need some other do you need an antibacterial to offset the infection that this virus is promoting, then you get that. Um, so that type of support and managing the individuals as their particular problems present. Uh, but beyond that, it is going to be supportive care for the rest of us. Now, we, we like to talk about quarantine. So let me ask you this mm-hmm. question now. Uh, how do you, well, what suggestions would you offer in terms of the concept of quarantine Mm-hmm. In small spaces, let's say you're asked to quarantine at home, but you mm-hmm. don't. But you don't live alone. You live with three, four, five people in a small space. You have a small mm-hmm. kitchen. You have one bathroom and toilet. How do you manage that? It's that one is difficult because you you inevitably have to share a breathing room, which is a source of viral infection. So as best you can, you have to then quarantine within the five feet of your own body, which is basically some of the things that we're talking about already. So if we consider that six-foot distance inside the house, wherever you go, you carry that six-foot bubble around you, that's about the best you can do. Um, you can get to some, uh, some very aggressive needs. For example, you only have one bathroom, and it means that the person who is, who is infected or, propose, or you know, purported to be exposed infected, would then have to walk in with their little rag of bleach water so that when they're done with the bathroom, then you are, you know, you do a quick wipe down of the surfaces that you use and then leave it free for other people, clean for the other people. That requires a little bit of planning, but regular bleach is relatively inexpensive. And the, and the, the way to make your bleach water um, uh, capable of sanitizing is one bleach to nine water, right? So if you're using a cap full of bleach, it's nine caps of water. If you're using one cup of bleach, it's nine cups of water to make up the solution. And you can put that in a, in a bottle and you walk around with it. This is where tissues are going to come in handy and covering your cough because what you want is to isolate yourself even in a small space. Masks here 
for the infected person would be very critical. So that is a cheap strategy to keep the people with whom you have to live as free from you as possible. But the reality of the situation is that they're probably going to get infected anyway. And in, a, in that world, you want to pick out the vulnerable person and pay special attention to them in that small group. Children. You have children in the home. Children love to play. Yes, they may watch yes. it something online, but they get bored after a while. They're physical. They want yes. to move. And, of course, yes. we like to cuddle our kids as well. We want to give uh, <laughs> our grandchildren, our children a hug. How do you manage yes. that? Yes. You can't give them any hug. You can give them a hug after you bathe, change your clothes, wash your hands. Yes, you can do that. If you're not infected. If you are infected, then the children have to stay away from you. That same spacing is going to be important. They certainly can go outside. Everybody should be able to go outside. Like I said, the virus doesn't do well outside because of the UV radiation and the heat. It is not, it won't destroy it in your body, but it will certainly destroy it on surfaces, outdoors, you know, breathing air and so on. Um, so from the children's perspective, they, they will do a lot better than us, to be totally honest. They, 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 they seem to be getting away with it when the when the adults aren't. So they are not going to be my primary concern at the moment, to be totally honest. You just have to sign ways, man. This is where jigsaw puzzles come in handy. So if it, then it is down like mine is, then it's it, it, it becomes creativity that, that seals the deal. One quick point I want to make, and I've been saying it to people that have been calling over the last week. Now that you're home for several days, plant a garden. Because if this goes on for the year to 18 months that people are talking about, then we are going to have food problems. We may not run out of food. Um, but you can't predict what's coming in, how it's going to be managed. From outside, we can only, you know, we can only work with what we have here. And we have tons of land used, owned, and unowned and unused. We have this stuff in our own house, or in our own vicinity. Plant a garden, talk to your neighbor, get some seeds. You understand? Don't plant all the same thing in a group. Plant cucumbers over here and tomato over here. Peas come in in about you know, 60 days. You know, your broccoli, some cabbage, some carrot can grow, you think it. These are all wonderful fruits. Kale does well here. Pak choy does well here. And, and green bananas are available. But, and the monkeys don't like green bananas so much. So these are, these are ways that we can occupy our time, get our children involved, and produce in a way for an apocalyptic crisis going forward. And hopefully we never go back to how it was before. I was talking to someone in New York City uh, who, uh, lo- whose best friend lost uh, her mom, um, wow. but, but the mom lev- never left the home. The mom was uh-huh. always indoors. So I want you to speak to us a little bit about when you go home. So some of us are essential workers. Some of us basically have to do something. Mm-hmm. When you get mm-hmm. home, right? So let's say you're young and it can't affect you so much, and you have older mm-hmm. people in the home, and you get home. What? Because mm-hmm. you, you, Okay, so you wash your hands, but it's not just your hands, is it? You got your fabric, right? So, so, so there are there are strategies that people are touting and developing depending on the world that you're in. But the idea is, um, don't wear your work clothes home. What we've done at Meridian Medical is that we come in our street clothes. You get dressed at your at your house, street clothes, and then when you get to the office, you put on scrubs, and then you interact with your patients in scrubs and your lab coats and so on. And then you take those off, leave them at the office, and then put on back your street clothes and go home so that you reduce the risk of the fabric bringing it home, even if your hands are washed. Some people take it a step further in that before they interact with their family, the clothes go in the laundry, the special garbage bag laundry, because that reduces it spreading around, and then you shower head to toe and then interact with your family. But you have to do this consistently. Shoes should not come inside. You should stay outside. 
And so, and, and th- that is the, at, well, at least, you know, at the door. So, so that's the, but every family has to come up with their own strategy. So the important part here is to, is to figure it out, is to learn what's in your particular world and how can you adapt your world to make it work for you. So if you have a bathroom close to your door, close to your inside, when you get in, then that would be the bathroom that you would use. And then you forbid everybody else from using it. That kind of way. Or you have a, or you have a, a bleaching policy, a, a sanitizing policy in your house that say um, the, the, this bathroom is going to be sanitized every, every, you know, twice per day. It, 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 the variations are going to be wide, but it requires us thinking about it ahead of schedule, being creative based on what is available to us and what are our resources. No, answer the question. Yeah, man. Yeah, you did. You always answer my questions, you know. You don't have a difficulty at all. But let me ask you about the sufferer. Um, and, and the mm-hmm. sufferer is, is the person who, across the Caribbean, is trying their very best with very limited resources. What are some of the um, things they can do that don't really hurt their pockets? And, of course, they can't get access to sanitizer. They can't get access to this and that. And even mm-hmm. if they could, they couldn't buy a whole lot because, you know, right. the money is really, the money is not flowing. The resources, so, yeah. So what, what would you say to them in terms of uh, homemade or uh, Meridian Medical <laughs> Corner made? <laughs> some, yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, some, some things are, wow. Dr. Dr. Lybird came up. I saw him on, on we have a little doctor's chat, and I saw him with a picture of a homemade uh, um, shield that uses half of a island purified big water bottle. They cut it vertically through the through the cap downwards, and then you have a face mask. That's cheap. You can get two face masks out of every out of every bottle, and because it's plastic. You can somewhat see through it, and it's definitely a barrier. That's cheap. Bottles are everywhere. Just another form of recycling. Um, we, we use a garbage bag strategy a lot. You cut the top off, the, you cut a hole, in, a neck hole in the garbage bag, and arm holes, and all of a sudden, you have a cheap, um, you have a cheap biohazard suit because now your body is protected from the spray of your, of your patient's client's interaction. Uh, you can't do that with masks. That's a, that's a problem. To, to manufacture a mask, it's a little online sometimes, might require a little bit more doing. You can't use cloth to filter out viruses. That's not going to work. You have a false sense of security. It can certainly help you with droplets, but, but it doesn't do very much to prevent the... the a, a viral particles from getting into you, especially if you're in the world where the viruses exist. So the mask might prove a little bit more challenging. Um, plastic is going to be your best bet. So if you can figure out a way to use plastic in your as your mask, then yes. But hopefully, this is what this, we're calling upon the creativity of the of the Caribbean population uh, to to achieve. The bleach is cheap and available. Um, it, and use bleach a lot. Practically every household will have at least some bleach, and that's a, that's as good a sanitizing agent as you need. You don't need alcohol. You just have to, you know, contend with the downside of using bleach everywhere, which is you know spots on your clothes and stuff. Uh, and like I mentioned before, any soap, any soap is a good starting point. Soap's job is to digest, is to dissolve fat. And it does a very good job with viruses. So household soap, laundry soap, dish soap, hand soap, face soap, blue soap, all can work for cleaning, for cleaning yourself of viruses. So, so in, in that, you can share a whole, how much soap do you need? You have one powerful blue soap bar. You cut it up into small pieces, and there's your family. Everybody have a little piece of soap. So it can certainly, we can certainly find ways around it. And finally, Doc, and you know, mm-hmm. I, I want to thank you for that because I'm always thinking of you know how you're going to keep up if you don't have the resources, and there must mm-hmm. be 
And we are, as Caribbean people, we are very creative people. So we just need a little. Mm. We just want a little, mm, a little, a little. <laughs> you know, we, we just a want little, a little, a little push thing. Yeah, a little right thing. Direction. And, yes. and once, agree. Agree. once we get in gear, are we good to go? Finally, now, um, you know, in terms of. Uh, we're social creatures, as, as we spoke about early on, and we spoke about social yeah. distancing. Uh, I want to turn it on its head and talk about social inclusion in the context mm-hmm. of those people who perhaps you have not reached out to for a long time. It's a good time now yes. to perhaps, you think, um, give somebody a call, check in on people, especially yes. those who yes. can't visit at the moment. Yes, which is, where, which is where me and social distancing kind of separate. Because I think, as you mentioned, you're calling it social inclusion, which is a good idea. Because now is the time when we, especially we can't go anywhere, we are savvy enough with our tech to say, no, 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 we, we are going to, we, we can still meet, we just have to do it via Zoom. And yes, our neighbor down the road that we barely talk to because she's home when I am at work and vice versa, now is the time for us to reach across. So we can't necessarily go have a conversation across the fence, but we can certainly pick up the phone and call or have a or have a WhatsApp chat, you know? It's a nice way to get close to our family. Everybody's home, and we can, people we don't, and family that we don't usually talk to, now is a good time. We can make new friends. We can decide, say, you know what? We are going to go out of our way to include others. And we, we can do it haphazardly, sure. Pick, stick to the people we like and know. But it's also a, 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 an opportunity for social of social diversity and social change in terms of just the people who we, we interact with, who we usually interact with. We can now change, expand that. So I think that this might be a good opportunity to take the negative part of the, our very media-centered world and use it to our social advantage. Now, there's a no legitimate reason to be on Facebook, legitimate reason to do Hangouts because we can keep those lines open. And I think we, we already know how to do it. It's just that we need to do it now with a purpose, not just to waste time. Doc, I want to thank you very much. Uh, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your recommendations and your ideas, and I want to wish you and your team, your family, all the very best as we yes, all sir. adapt and adjust to what is reality uh, these days. Thank you so uh, much for your time. <laughs> well, thank you for having me once again online. Um, it, this, is, this is useful. The more information we can get out there, the better. Merida Medical will have to set up a helpline or a lifeline, is what we're going to call it, so that we can, we can, even when we're not at work, people can still get information. Um, we're going to have to do it because as, as, as part of the social inclusion policy, uh-huh. how do you get accurate information from people who, who you know, have them sing around the pulse of things? And, and, and if you want to be creative, ask some questions. Because maybe what you're thinking may work with a little tweak. Ah. Or, it may be, or it may not work um, and you don't know. You know? And so it, it should be an interactive process. Well, you know, it, it should be. It has to be, Doc. I mean, in these days, yes. you know, I, I'm seeing more and more people just sending messages, you know, statements, recorded statements. Yes. I mean, they have a, they're useful. But nothing beats uh, an interaction where someone can say, hey, I understand what you're yeah. saying, but let me ask you this. So the, yeah. the question and answer part of it is, I think, is vital. And I think I, I have so. a small, a very small crystal ball, which I'm going to just rub a bit right now. I can tell you something. Uh-huh. I'm seeing in your future mm-hmm. an app, an app, an app, Doc, uh-huh. with a bot who answers questions 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my, my, my brother is a, my brother is IT, so I will ask him about that. All right, okay. Well, have a great day, man. Take care. All right, right. bye, bye, everyone. Yeah, right. bye, bye. What do you want in your pharmacy? Superior service? Check Meridian Medical Pharmacy. Quality drugs? Definitely Meridian Medical Pharmacy. Great prices? Always Meridian Medical Pharmacy. Call Meridian Medical Pharmacy at 465-5096 or 7 or 662-3274. Or stop by at South Independent Square Street, Bastyr. Meridian Medical Pharmacy. Quality products, superior service, best prices. And that's our program for today. Dr. Andrew Holness. And yours truly, Clive Backus, having a chat. On Meridian Medical Corner, broadcast on Wednesdays, right here on Minifam 98.9. 
WINN is 98.9. 98.9 is Win FM. is 98.9. The management of Amory Bakery would like to show support to our many customers and the general public as the Federation and the world go through this trying and difficult time. We are confident that we will overcome this situation. However, in the meantime, we will be doing our part to provide much needed assistance. For the months of March and April 2020, all bread will be sold at a 20% discount. Please take advantage of this special offer. Amory Bakery, quality you can taste, a name you can trust. May God bless us all. 